Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Pastor Mark Motor, Berean Church in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. Pete Giacalone, South Hills Assembly of God Church, Bethel Park, PA. Pastor J. Anthony Gilbert of Another Level Ministries in Mount Washington. Pastors, it is great to be with you. I don't know if we got the plaid section going on here uh, and the tie section over here. I don't know. We'll see. In the new we'll chair. <laughs> In the new, new chair. chair. Right. Right. Yeah, new chair. Bless, the, bless the Lord, oh my soul. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on up. That's right. Well, today's topic is where is our allegiance? Isn't that an interesting question? Let's dive in here. So here's the first one. To what extent should a Christian's allegiance be to their country? Pastor Pete, I'm going to well, ask you. when the, the very first quote I thought of immediately, and it wasn't scripture, so but I'm going to get the scripture. The very first thing I thought of was uh, in the '60s. Of course, you know I was alive then. You know, um, a few of us were. Yeah, 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 yeah. JFK said this: "Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country." And, and I see that theme, and of course, back in those days, it was always, Uncle Sam needs you. People were stepping up to the plate for helping to meet the needs of America. Also, I was told that before that, in World War II, many, many, many men took their own lives because of the fact that they didn't qualify for armed services. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that the passion for America was quite different than what it is today. Uh, and then I immediately thought, now I'm going to bring this more religious. We're going to sanctify it. I, I immediately thought of Livingston, the great missionary Livingston. And when he left Africa, the natives stopped the coffin, opened the coffin, and cut out his heart and said, you can have his body, but his heart belongs here in Africa. And, you know, we hear this, these slogans, you know, uh, to make America great. And again, I am not going political. I'm just using that. But to make America to be what she needs to be, if the believer doesn't have a passion for America, then who's going to have a passion? We have our faults. We have our failures. We have our mistakes. And immediately my mind ran to 1 Corinthians 13. I do it at every wedding. If you love someone, you'll be loyal to them no matter what the cost. And, and I think if we love our country, now again, what I want to eliminate here, I'm not talking about a political party. I'm talking about the same America my father fought for, your yeah. dad fought yeah. for. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. So I believe, yes, America needs us as believers to be out in front uh, leading and again, I, I want, I, I, I'm trying to well, disassociate yeah, myself with political. Let's, let's, uh, that's, that's a good point. I like what you said. Let's go over to Pastor Glaze. Yeah, and, and it says to what extent should a Christian's allegiance be to their country? And, you know, I look at uh, Daniel chapter 3 with the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And in Exodus, it says that you shall not worship, you know, create any gods or, or bow down to them. And we know Nebuchadnezzar set up this statue and, you know, wanted them to worship. And so at that point, they had to check, well, where, where's my allegiance? Is my allegiance to the law or is my allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon? And it says here, there are certain Jews who thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the image which thou hast set up. So, you know, to what extent, I, I say that the extent where it causes us to be in violation of the law of God. Yeah. Then at that point, I think that that's where we part our allegiance yes. from our country. Interesting, uh, you know, quite often in history, the religion, and we're gonna be talking about this a little bit, that there was like the state religion. And if you didn't worship the way they wanted, then there was a problem. And uh, of course the allegiance is first to God. How about on this side? Uh, I know for myself, I totally agree that the Word of God has to be the full standard, and if anything the government does is against that, we go with the Scripture. But in my missionary travels, 25 countries, I am so grateful for the United States. It is not perfect, but I honor it, I bless it, I pray for it. 
And I would love to see us get back to recognizing our faults, but realizing that God has blessed this nation, uh, this nation yes. to send missionaries out, to be a beacon of freedom. And we need to stand for that freedom because that's being attacked. I think of one verse in Galatians where the scripture says that we, that we need to make sure that our liberty is held fast. Hold fast to the liberty that we have yes. as a nation. That's Jesus today. said, render unto God, to God the things that are God. Yes. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. You know, you take a look, even as the Marines, where it's God, core, country. Mm -hmm. I think it's in that order. Uh, and I think it's the same way. God should be number one. Yeah. Then your allegiance to your country. And I'm not talking about the core, but, you know, I think it, that's the order. So when you're looking at in regards to allegiance, I think you can have your allegiance to both, but not at the expense of our walk with God and the Word of God. Absolutely. I think we're, we're, we're all coming to the same conclusion that, yes, we should be uh, have an allegiance to our country, but not where they would have us uh, cross a line of right. uh, God's Word. Well, let's let's move on to kind of this is, is this is how we're working our way in the world here. Okay. How about this one? Should Christians boycott companies that support ungodly policies and practices? Pastor Grace. Well, you know, I, I hate to identify companies, okay. but I know I know Christians that will not go to Target, you know, for, uh, because Target does a lot of things, you know, in the to support the uh, the gay and lesbian community. I know that they will not let the Salvation Army out in front, you know, during Christmas. And so there are Christians that will not, you know, go to Target. But then there are other Christians that that do go to Target. So, you know, what you know, how does somebody decide whether to go or not go, whether to boycott or not boycott? And I'll okay? I speak to that for just one quick minute. Sure. I boycotted Target after the Salvation Army thing uh, and, and uh, they wouldn't let them out front anymore. And uh, and then the Salvation Army settled with them on okay. that. Just to say, just to say that they they made a two million dollar donation to the Salvation Army. Salvation Army was like, okay, I don't have to ring my bell out in front anymore. But anyway, go yeah. ahead. But I, I was going to uh, uh, say in, in Romans 14, one man esteems another day more than another. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And then it goes to talk about you know one person regards one day, another person doesn't regard it. And so what I take away from that in reference to this is conscience. You know, that as you spend time with God and as you seek the Lord, that however he speaks to you, to your conscience, I think that that determines whether you boycott or not. Yeah. And I think, yeah, sure. I think the important thing there also is that we don't allow that to divide us. You may have convictions in certain situations. And, and, and I, I've seen this the last couple of years that the church has become divided, that if you don't agree with me, then, you know, my convictions supersede your convictions. I, I think a lot of this sometimes is personal convictions. That, uh, that's, a, that's a good point, and that's something that, uh, you know, can a Christian believe something strongly themselves but not put that on somebody else? That's, that's, that's the question, Jay. We well, you know, you get a little, uh, if you start getting too legalistic with it, uh, you get to a point where after a while, well, what if somebody is a dry cleaners and they uh, have a homosexual lifestyle? Do you not take your cleaners there? because they're homosexual. I mean, so it goes back to what you said. I think it comes back to the conscience. I think about the scripture in Corinthians, we talk about, should I eat meat offered unto idols? And yeah. Paul actually breaks down and says, well, it's not the meat that you're buying and going home and cooking that's the problem. It's the worshiping of the idols with the meat that's the negative thing. So going to Target to buy a pack of bubble gum, which for some people may say, you know, I don't want to support that because right. of that. Going there, it doesn't mean a person is in sin, uh, but what they stand for is. So now one thing I would say is that if you're going there on a certain day, Maybe they're saying this is transgender day. Come, all your money is going to go towards that. That might be a time that you that may say, maybe yeah. we should stop and not go. Everybody should boycott that. But just yeah. ulti you know, ultimately, if uh, they stand for something that we don't stand for, you got to go back to conscience, like Dr. Lee said. And I think there can be two extremes. When I was in Bible school, the thinking was, I'm just called to preach the word. I don't need to be involved in politics yeah. or things like yeah. that. We just preach the gospel. And then on the other side, there are Christians that are so politically minded, they're not even spiritually minded. Yeah. So the balance is the kingdom is first. I don't want to be so enwrapped in this that it consumes me. But on the other hand, if the other side is going to take a stand against righteousness, the church needs to take a stand for righteousness. Yeah. It may be a little different from person to person, mm -hmm. but we need mm -hmm. to let our voice be known. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what's interesting about this is uh, one time I was, there was a certain company that we were being asked to boycott. And I found out they're part of a conglomerate. I was going to have to boycott so many companies. It was like <laughs> impossible. It was going to be impossible, you know, to, to boycott everything. But real good discussion. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And coming up in 60 seconds, we're going to ask, and this is, we just alluded to this, does religion have a place in politics? You don't want to miss that. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Hard Questions. We're having a great discussion so far, and we have a hot potato for you coming up here. <laughs> okay, Pastor Mark, I'm gonna ask you to answer this one first. To what extent should we obey those in authority over us? Uh, great question. Uh, Romans 13 is what most people would probably think about. Verse one, everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Now, I believe generally speaking, as Christians, we should submit to our leaders, even if they don't know the Lord. But on the other hand, I do not believe this is unqualified, blind obedience. And I believe there are precedences in the book of Acts, I can think of two, where the apostles were told, do not preach, do not teach Jesus Christ. And they said, well, we're going to we're going to submit in our hearts, but we're not going to obey that. We have to obey God rather than men. And so I think it's important to recognize two things. One, uh, God does desire us generally to submit, but there are two times I believe we have a time to say, no, I'm going to stand against that one if it clearly goes against the Word of God. And I th we've seen some of those things in the last couple of years. Secondly, when it goes contrary to our human conscience. And I think of COVID and how that there's no verse that says to get the shot or not get the shot, but I know many of our people would not get it based on conscience. And we did not take a stand as a church, but we stood with those that had a particular perspective because we believe nothing should override our human conscience before God. That's, that's a, boy, that's a great point. Uh, Jay? You, you know, know, there's plenty of places in scripture where people have overrid government because it caused them to break the word of God. One of the great passages of scripture, I think, in this day and hour that we should all be reading through, which I believe is so apropos for this era that we're in, is the book of Daniel. Because uh, yeah. that's where we are. Yeah. That's where we are. Oh, I mean, Daniel, amen. they said, you're not allowed to pray. What I love about Daniel, yeah. he didn't just not say, he I'm going to pray. He <laughs> opened up and said, I want you all to see me <laughs> <Yeah>. praying. <laughs> you know, yeah. and then we see in Acts chapter 4 yeah. with yeah. Peter and John and how they uh, chose to preach the word of God as well. But what was amazing, though, which we don't talk a lot about, and then I'll pass it on here. Acts 2, we see a baptism, but they needed a different baptism for that. Acts 4, they said they were filled again yes. to speak the word of God with boldness because they were being threatened. And I believe that's what we need, that same boldness that Daniel had, Peter had, and yeah. John had. And that's they right. even prayed that, grant, your, grant us more boldness. Yes. So the more the opposition arose against them, the more, you know, it was like a, a pushing battle, you know. Uh, the more the government was pushing against the church, the church said, we're, we're going to push back. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and of course, you already talked about them, but I think of Meshach, Shadrach, and, and, and a billy goat. Oh, it's a bendy goat. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, when they said, you know, we're, we're quick to answer this. Yeah. We're gonna, King, yes. we're going to let you know right now, we're, we're, we're not going to stutter. Uh, whether it's right or not, you decide, but we know we're not going to bow down to your God. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I just want to say real quick that, and I'm not sure about these other pastors, but I know during COVID, uh, one of the things that I was getting from my members, uh, they were wanting religious exemption. Yes. And, and yes. so, you know, I had to sit down with them and, 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 and they were convinced in their heart that, that God was speaking to them mm -hmm. about not taking it. And so, I, you know, I, I did, you know, grant re religious exemptions. Uh, but one of the things I found out is that several people lost their jobs because their job didn't accept it. You know, they, they were being required, you know, to get the shot. So, right? uh, again, you know, it, it, this... This falls out in different forms, right? You know, I mean, from, you know, from what uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to COVID, you know, that people were willing to, you know, uh, lose their job uh, as a result of not obeying the government. Yeah, I think it brings, it's interesting, again, studying history, uh, Luther, <laughs> Zwingli, you know, Tyndale, they all disobeyed their, oh my gosh. their uh, governing authorities, you know, they, and, Frankly, they disobeyed their ecclesiastical authorities yeah. too. So we can, that's a whole other subject we can talk about, but let's move on to the next one. So this is the real hot potato here. Does religion have a place in politics? What is the role of church and government in society? I have to tell you, Jay, before we get to you, I reframed this, I wrote down here, does God have a place in government? That's how I view this question, but anyway. You know, we need like a half hour just for this because there's so much to unpack. It's not a small question. You can say yay or nay. I mean, there's so much to it. You look all throughout the scriptures. The scripture clearly shows that the church has a role. I think it's very unique to notice. Now, going back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, it talks about, isn't it unique that the Antichrist, when he comes, will be a political leader? 
And this is what the Lord put upon my heart. And I think this is important. Should the church have a role? Of course it should. Because whenever the devil wants to change the times and the seasons, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 7, 25, he said he will seek to intend the, the times and the laws. Mm. Then the saints will be given into his hands. And so when the devil wants to change the times, he uses legislation. When God wants to change the times, he uses revelation. And so what happens if, re if legislation is in place and the church doesn't take its place mm -hmm. to speak against demonic legislations yes, yes. and to speak to evil leaders, what happens is that legislation can shift times and shift eras, which is why the Antichrist is going to come as a political leader. So we don't need to be involved in politics per se to just say, well, I'm Republican, I'm Democrat. We have to understand the structure of how demonic foes use legislation to put the word of God into bondage and to bring the church into a place where it can keep it down. That's why it says after he changes those times and laws, the saints will then be given into his hands. So it's important that we're involved in politics to the degree that the kingdom of God is greater than Republican, Democrat, independent, monarchy, all those things. And that is what is called to be the salt of the earth. That is what's called to be the light of the world. And we have to make sure that those things that they're doing, we speak to those and be the voice of the kingdom to those areas. And, and Jay, if I can trump in there, doesn't it also say that, that if possible to deceive the very elect. Matthew 24. <clears throat> to deceive. So, so in other words, if ever there's a day we need the, I'm going to say the, the light of the Christianity. Light. Yeah. I'm yeah. Gonna, I, 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 I didn't like that word religion, I, and I'm not picking on yeah. you. Yeah. <clears throat> because then that means it's open no, to it's all not religion. That's my question. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, but, but again, we need those people on the front lines to declaring, heralding the truth. That's right. Because if we don't have that, we're just going to be like sheep being Did led. You just said, I don't want to trump in there. You just said that, <laughs> didn't you? I mean, that's a, a slip of the tongue. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Ever heard one? My oh, goodness, Pastor uh, Mark. Well, when I first got saved and was hungry for God, we had a church where a lot of young people were coming in. And if someone really loved Jesus, we thought, you've got to be called to be a pastor. You've yeah. got to go into ministry. But to me, what I'm finding is ministry is so much more than just preaching behind the pulpit. And I believe one of the things God is doing in this hour is sending people into every man's world. That's good. And so, you know, you've got religion, you've got the family, you've got education. Think of how our educational system has changed in yeah. the last 20 yeah. or 30 years. Why? The wrong people are making the laws, having a voice there. We need to get godly people who take a stand for biblical values in all of these different areas. And they're called to do that just as much as we may be called to stand behind a pulpit. So I believe it's the hour for people to go into every man's world, whether they're an accountant, an athlete, a, a, a a sports figure, whatever it is, to make a difference and take a stand for Jesus. You know, uh, I think it's so so good what everybody's saying here. And Bill, I want to get your your point. What what's what's left a bad taste in some people's mouth is that, that the Evangelical Christian Church has been identified with the Republican Party very yes. closely. Yes. The African American Church, not so much so, but the the white Evangelical Church has tended to be identified with the Republican Party, and people are saying, "Hey, I don't like what the Republican Party is doing. I don't like. Why should I? Why should I? Why should that be part of?" me being identified. So this is where this religion and politics and people are like, I'm fed up with this. But God has something to say to every area of life, including government. Right. Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, our founding fathers uh, put that clause in there, separation of church and state for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't want the church to be the, you know, run the, run the country and they didn't want the, the state to run the church. Right. So, you know, we need to be wise in understanding how we can make a difference. And I think that what everybody has said around the table uh, lends to the fact that these are ways that we can make a difference, you know, without violating the, the clause, you know, that, you know, of, of church and state. So, you know, I, I do think it's important that we get involved, uh, even though, you know, the, the church can't run the government, because I think that's what you see in that. That's what happened in the Church of England. That's what happened in a lot of Muslim countries, you know, that Islam you know, runs the country. So, you know, you, you have to be careful from that standpoint. But as, as Mark said, you know, we got, have to get Christians involved or bring God into government, you know, through, uh, through transformation. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting about England, you know, the queen passed a little while yeah. ago and she was the head of the church. And so the governmental figure right. was the head of the church. 
it really hasn't stopped England from sliding, you know, uh, far away from biblical Christianity in many cases. Sorry if you're British there, but uh, <laughs> but anyway, we're going to take a, a, a quick a quick break, and after that, we're going to have a question from our call-in hotline. When a viewer asks, "Why does it seem that we were better off as a society in the olden days?" We'll be right back. You know, one of my favorite things is when we, we have the call-in hotline. All the questions, for the most part, come from uh, you, come from viewers. And uh, so we've opened up our hotline, and we have a question now. I read Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 10, and it says, Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. And my question is, why is it not wise to add such questions? But sometimes it, it feels like the old days were better than where we are now. So I'd appreciate your instruction on this and, and comment on this. Well, some of us remember the old days, Pete, so, <laughs> hey, so tell from me. From the 50s rock and roll to, <laughs> to the invasion of, of the 60s with the England and, and women's lib and all that, yeah, lived it all. But here's the part, part that, that concerns me. I, I believe that if we're constantly looking back, I, maybe I'm reading into this, but if we're constantly looking back to the old days, then we're going to ignore what's, what's right going on right now. And the future is going to definitely look that much more bleak. So I, I believe that I think what I think what the writer here is saying is, <clears throat> don't get caught up almost like Lot's wife, as they're fleeing from Sodom and Gomorrah. There, there is there was a something, some type of passion was in her heart that she did not, and I'm not trying to judge her. She did not want to leave Sodom and Gomorrah. God so, already did that. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, you know, uh, I think what Solomon is saying here is is that you can't get caught up in desiring the old days yeah. because then you don't want to change. That's you right. know, I, I see so many people that are that are in the church that see the way that it was. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and they, they're not open to the spirit of God. The spirit of God is doing something new. The spirit of God is doing something exciting. And so what Solomon said, don't get caught up, so caught up in the old days that you, you as Pete said, you can't move ahead. You know, you can't look uh, for the future. So I, I think that that's the key of what Solomon is saying here. Yeah, that's a good point. Where are we going here, Well, guys? I'd just say this. You can remember the past. You can honor the past, but don't live there. Hey. I know that as a church, what church was like before COVID is different than oh, after. Yeah. And right or wrong, right. you're never going to put that genie back in the bottle. Yeah. So you've got to recognize where we are and make adjustments. So we can all enjoy certain things from our past, but the reality is we live in 2022 right. and we right. need to recognize that and put our hearts there and not just say, I wish it used to be like thus and so. It's not, God is doing a new thing and let's get involved with what he's doing right now. Remember not the former things. That's yeah. right. Neither That's right. consider the things old. The Bible makes it very clear. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. So whenever you want, this is a thing, and I don't know who's watching this, but many times when you're looking back, God is ready to do it. It's the devil's plot right. to keep you back there because God's ready to spring something brand new into your life. Wow. And you're looking at the old manna when he's got a promised land that flows with milk and honey, and you're yearning for the, you're for the uh, leeks and right. greens of Egypt. Egypt. Yeah, yeah. You're right, and, right. and not understanding, he's got a whole, a whole food group you've never had before that you're going to own, but we have to be willing to let go of those things. And I think it's so important in the day and hour that we're living in. Cause I get it because it's so difficult right now, but what we do when you, when you do that, you keep looking back, you limit God too. You, you don't, it's almost like, well, God, I want to go back there. God's like, don't you understand the same one that blessed those problems and those situations right. where sin abounds grace does that much more even abound in our lives now. So instead of looking back, looking for the old days, no matter how bad it is out in front of us, let's begin to thank God that he's still the God that was the God in Egypt. He was the God that caused them when they had all the stuff going on there, that he still brought light to them and there was locusts there, but there was no locusts in Goshen. He still wants to bless us today. So let's take the limits off and let's believe God for the new thing he's doing today. Uh, you, you know, I, I was going to say too, uh, somebody said that COVID uh, didn't cause problems, it exposed problems. Yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and so 
we need to make keep the keep the change and move with the new as the, the problems have been exposed. And let the problems bring us together and yeah. not divide us. You know, the church, we see that in the, in the early church, that every problem from, from serving the widows and, and ongoing, on, it brought the, the council at Jerusalem in chapter 15, it brought the church together, that's not right. apart. That's right. We shouldn't pine away. I think that's a good yeah. way to put it. Uh, you know, my wife is real good at turning the page. Me, I'm like, I pine for those old days a lot of times, you know, and we, we've got, we have to not do that. Well. You know, we have a scripture that we want to end the program with, and here it is. It's, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. That's Psalm 103, 19. What a great thing. What a great way to remember that his sovereignty rules over Amen. everything. Amen. That puts a capstone on this program, I think. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's program and we want to hear from you. Email us with your questions to hardquestions at ctvn.org or call in to our hotline at 412-349-4326. Have a great day.